Welcome, Mr. Perry. Thank you very much. Good My stuff. My pleasure Good being stuff. here. I've uh, talked to a few of your friends, legends on legends, and uh, there's quite a few things they said about you. So they uh, said, I, I asked them, what would you say about Mr. Egbert Perry? And they said, well, he's known as the father of mixed income housing. Uh, he is the largest minority real estate developer of affordable housing with over 50 communities. Sure. They said, uh, and it's um, when we Google you, this, this shows up on everything. You are the former chairperson of Fannie Mae. That's correct. Uh, a soccer enthusiast. And uh, you helped develop the Russell Company in its earliest days. And for those of you that don't know the Russell Company, it is one of the largest minority construction companies in the United States. You are also the CEO of Integral, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, I was cautioned that if you start the conversation off with anything other than uh, a little talk about where you're from, uh, Antigua, that I would be uh, in bad shape. So we're going to start <laughs> off. If you could tell us a little bit about where you grew up and how it informs who you are today, and then we'll talk a little bit about what you do and what makes you a legend. Fair enough? Well, fine. Wonderful. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, a little louder, good evening. <laughs> all right. Just, um, first of all, your, your information is pretty good. I'm curious to know who you got it from, uh, but you're I, not going to tell I, me, right? I, I'll leave it. I'll leave it to afterwards. Okay. All right. Yeah, so uh, Egbert Perry. I'm from a little island in the Eastern Caribbean named Antigua. And when you look on the map, you see, you think it's a little speck of dirt, and you try to scrape, and you realize, no. That's a whole country. That's what it is. A little, little speck on the map, 60,000 people. I left there um, right after my 15th birthday to come to the US. And I finished my high school, last two years of high school in New York. Um, number nine of 11 kids. And um, I had the best parents somebody could have. I was born in a little bit of heaven on earth because it was Fun in the sun, 365 beaches, one for every day of the year. And life was great. It was what I call the proverbial African village. It takes a village to raise a child. And all the adults looked out for the children and just had a wonderful childhood. Good, good. Can you tell us a little bit about Integral, the, the company that you have right now? I think we need to build perspective you have a rather large firm. Uh, you're the largest minority or one of the largest minority uh, residential developers in the United States. Can you talk a little bit about that, size, what you do, and that thing? Uh, that's probably an overstatement. I don't know. I don't measure that. But oh, we've been, actually, last month, we turned 30 years old as a company. So I started the company 30 years ago. So that probably means before most of you were born. That's a shame. I'm feeling pretty bad about that, <laughs> feeling pretty old about that. Um, but I started the company really to transform urban America. Um, the focus, I said I'm number nine of 11 kids. What I didn't say is uh, in the Antigua I grew up in, our household income growing up was about $1,000 US a year for all 11 kids and my mother and father. I was not poor, never thought I was poor, never felt I was poor. I may have been economically challenged, which I didn't realize till I came to this country and realized that, uh, let's put it in perspective, um, my father, when I arrived at the school, it was a boarding school, I got to New York a couple weeks earlier because I had a sister living in Queens, New York. And I stayed with her for almost two weeks and then went to the boarding school. And by the time I got there, there was an envelope with my father's return address on it, my name on it, opened the envelope. And all that was in the envelope was a $20 bill in a sheet of paper uh, folded inside. And hidden inside of the paper. He had sent me, my father had sent me $20. I cried, I went to the, back to the dorm. In those days, there were phones on the wall, so you pick up the phone and 
call collect. We didn't have cell phones. Um, and I called home and told him he didn't need to send me that kind of money. I'll be fine. And I sent the money back home. And about two or three days later, a couple of the guys in the dorm said, hey, let's go down to whatever the a main street was and said, let's go get some burgers. So I walked down there with him, with them. And they got in there. I looked up on the wall. I saw a hamburger, saw all kinds of things. And I saw the prices, and I cried again. That's the day I realized we didn't have any money. So all these years, my parents, everybody conned us because we thought we were high society back home because it was about who you knew, who your parents were, what kind of people they were, and so on. So that was the value system. And so the stark reality that this place was about the dollar mm. was an awakening experience for me. Mm. Um, so that's how I got here. So when I started Integral and I said I was going to revitalize urban America, it was to create communities where people independent of or agnostic to the income could live in the same community because I grew up in an environment where there were well-off, not so well-off, and poorly-off people living. We never thought about separating based on incomes. Mm. And so I had this idealistic view that I was going to create a, a mixed-income community and great school and so on and so forth. And literally, that's what we tried to do. So we created what became the very first mixed income community built anywhere in the United States with low income families, people that were public housing eligible, middle income and upper all in the same community, a new school, a YMCA, early childhood development center, retail, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, on the site of what was the country's very first public housing project, mm. which we demolished to do that. So it was a 60-acre development. I woke up the next day, and we were national experts. And so that's really the luck of the draw and the early days of Integral. Wow, 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 and wow. And since then, we have developed maybe 10,000 units of housing in a bunch of communities in about 20 cities across the country. Wow. So, so some of the research that I, uh, I did, yeah. um, you went to Wharton, correct? Yeah. And out of Wharton, you came to work for uh, Herman Russell. Correct. And uh, again, a, a little birdie told me that you wrote the business plan, you structured sort of how they were set up and ran the company for almost 11 years. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Close. Um, I, so there again, so life is about luck. They say when you have success, when preparation and opportunity meet. So you have to keep preparing because you never know when the opportunity is going to show up. And, right. I, and I'm going to interrupt you for a second because I, I say it as if everyone would know who Herman Russell is. Herman Russell is not only one of the, it was the third largest construction company. They're the construction company that built the airport that we have here in Atlanta. Um, Herman J. Russell used to bail Martin Luther King out of, out of jail. He was, he was the first check and first bit of money uh, written for Martin Luther King. He is uh, no longer with us. The company still exists and is a major construction company. But I don't want to take for granted that everyone knows who Herman J. Russell is. So it, it's a little bit of a big deal that, um, that Mr. Perry uh, actually set up the company. Well, yeah, so don't, again, I, I never, you'll never find me taking credit for something that I didn't do or overstate in anything I've ever done. So let's be clear. Herman Russell was a name, a legend, a brand before I ever came to Atlanta. I came to Atlanta in 19, 1980, started work at Russell January 7, 1980. I was 24 years old. And four months into my time, and I was hired as assistant to the president. So. Going back, I was seven years at Penn, four years on the grad, I was civil engineering. Grad school, I have a master's in structural engineering. And I also then went to 
into the business school, which is Wharton, and so I have degrees in finance and accounting. Mm -hmm. I went to work in D.C. for a year and then came to Atlanta mm -hmm. to work at Russell. By then, I was, I was 24. Um, I was hired as assistant to the president, and I didn't know how I got here until I had been here a year in Atlanta. Turns out Herman's daughter, Donata, either she or her roommate was in a calculus class I was tutoring. And she got my resume from a faculty administrator that ran the tutoring center, sent her resume to her father, Herman, and said, you got to try and hire this guy. I didn't know it. He called me. Uh, I was in my dorm room. I answered the phone. And I blew him off. I had no interest in coming to Atlanta. Um, I thought they were still lynching black people down here. <laughs> so I was staying up that side. So I went to work in D.C. And truth be told, my girlfriend had graduated and gone back to work to D.C., which is where she was from. So D.C. was the only place I was going to work. So it was easy not to come to Atlanta. I saw a glass ceiling very quickly at the company I went to. Didn't think I needed to take that on. So I called Russell back and said, asked him if he was still interested in talking. He said yes. Flew me down that weekend, interviewed me, offered me a job, and three months later, I started at H.J. Russell & Company as uh, assistant to the president. So the story about the business plan is, here I am, 24 years old. He asked me to write a business plan for the company. I did. Um, I did. It was April. I gave it to him in October. The vision was that the company was going to be a billion dollar company by 1995. And I laid out the strategy and so on and so forth. Thinking back over it, it was probably a lousy business plan, but it seemed like a good plan at the time. <laughs> and uh, by my birthday, birthday is July, so by the time I gave it to him, I was already 25. He called me in one Saturday. We spent three, three and a half hours in the office going through the plan and talking. And then he said, OK, first of next month, you're running the company. I was 25 years old. Now, I wouldn't have hired me <laughs> if I was him. So the, the Herman Russell I know is the individual who gave me a chance that I would not have gotten anywhere else in life. And so I took over running the company at the ripe old age of 25, and I was there for 12 more years. So I was there for a total of about 13 years, seven days short of 13 years. And I left to start the revitalization of urban communities across the country. Mm -hmm. Now, now I, I, I'm also told, my mic's working, everyone can hear me still? Seems like it's not. Okay. Okay, good. They good. could just then. All right. See. So I'm also told that you could do anything at this point, uh, work on any segment of the industry, but you intentionally, intentionally are focused on this uh, mixed income community. I, I'm also told by that same set of folks that it's intentional because you've seen the psychological benefits of how it can impact certain segments of the community. Can, can you tease that out a little bit further than, than what they share with me? Uh, they may be giving me more credit than I deserve, but I chose this for the reasons I described earlier, right? So it's about revitalization of communities and creating opportunities where people without economic means can still access the things that I now take for granted. So if I think back over it, what's a mixed income community? Does anybody know what mixed income is? Explain. Somebody, just stick your hand up. Does anyone say. know what mixed income is? Community. OK, so we? Yes, please. Uh, 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 Thank you that? very much. What is a mixed income community? Um, so based off the example he gave earlier, a community where some people might be low income receiving public housing, some people might be working class or middle income, and some people might even have higher levels of income all living in the same community. 
Very well said. And okay. seamlessly integrated into the community. So think about you're on an airplane. You bought your ticket. You're a very thoughtful person. You plan ahead. You bought your ticket a month ago, and you got it for $250, and you're flying up to New York. The person sitting right next to you on the plane was a lazy bum. They didn't think about it. And they, re they ran out of time, and then they bought their ticket, and it cost $400 because they didn't plan ahead. They both sit on the plane. They get the same lousy bag of peanuts or whatever. <laughs> Nobody says, has a record to say, well, you paid $250, so I'm going to give you different service than this person who paid $400. They're going to get better service. So the idea is to create a community that people can just be people and not poor people or middle income or whatever. It's just a mixed income community, but it affords people the same kinds of experience. If you have a good school in a mixed income community or, uh, that the mixed income community is zoned to, then lower income, middle and upper income people have access to the same quality education. So the idea is to create a community that isn't segregated based on people's economic circumstances. Since I wasn't born rich and never developed the gene to overconsume, I have a car I've been driving for 21 years. I have one house. I don't have an extra house. I don't have planes. I don't do any of that stuff. I actually probably don't have the money to do all that stuff. But it's not who I am. And so if you don't develop the trappings where you're working to support a lifestyle, then you can do the things that you want to do and care to do. So I'm doing what I want to do. So what people may be referring to is I don't have champagne tastes. I have beer taste, I actually don't drink, but I have beer taste, and that's fine because I live like if I have a beer budget. And so that's what they're referring to. I'm not um, trying to impress anyone. Uh, the two people I would want to impress are both deceased. Um, and so that's, that's, that may be what they're referring to. Okay, okay. So two questions. And I'm going to open it up to the audience here. One question, I hear you're a soccer enthusiast. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. tell, tell us a little bit about that. Um, one, I, one neat little fact about Oglethorpe is that uh, uh, about a third of the student body are athletes. Huh. So uh, you're talking to about a third of the audience are athletes. Tell me a little bit about that. I, actually, I was a very good runner. I was a middle distance 880 and mile. I grew up at the time, we didn't, weren't in the metric system, so it was an 880. Now it's 800 meters. So I, that's, I did a lot of that at home, and I also played soccer. In my, when I came to the country and I finished my first year of the two years of high school, I had three brothers going to school in Berkeley, at University of California, Berkeley. So that summer, I went out to Berkeley, my oldest brother got me out there and I stayed with him. And while I was out there, I played on a soccer team. And I was offered a professional contract. I hadn't turned 16 yet. Um, but they were paying $500 a game. That's what, that's what you got as a pro in soccer in 1971. So I decided maybe I better do something else if I was going to make a living. So I went back to school, and I didn't take the, didn't take the offer. But I was a decent soccer player. But I, went to, I came to the wrong country for the sport I knew and played. Um, and that was probably just as good, because if it was another sport, who knows? I may have gotten a big head full of myself, gotten in trouble, and so on. So the Lord tends to save you from yourself and give you what you need, not what you want. And so I probably got what I needed. Um, and so, yeah, so I consider myself a decent player. I'm not that good now. I, I didn't play 
I played for one year in college, but I was doing, I was in engineering school. I was working full time, really didn't have time. So I just played intramural soccer and that was it. Okay. Now, it, it, it seems like your career path was rather intentional. We have a large amount of students in the room sitting here from a very modest, very successful person. What, what advice would you give to a student that is looking to sort of figure out what their plan should be moving forward? If you, if you survey, uh, which we informally do first day of class, everyone gets up, introduces themselves. I, I'd say about a third of the students are just still figuring out sort of career paths. What, what, what advice would you give them in terms of just sort of figuring that out? You seem rather intentional. Um, I may seem intentional now. I was not intentional. When I was in grad school, just so, so you can all feel very good if this sort of sounds like you. When I was in grad school, I my ambition was I wanted to have a job where I was making about $25,000 a year, had a car, and could chase women. <laughs> that was my ambition, honestly. And then I decided, OK, well, I'm going to go to DC, and uh, I'm going to hang out with my old girlfriend, and so on. Um, that's, again, the Lord saving me from myself. But I didn't really have uh, I had a drive to do my work. Okay. I didn't have a drive to go a specific path. What I did have is my own value system. Okay. And I think I followed my passion. So just to put it in perspective, when I was leaving school, when I finished my last uh, semester of grad school, so I had been in college now seven years, I, I got a call from Wharton Placement Center, and they said, Egbert, uh, well, they were looking for me. I said, yeah, this is Egbert. I said, yeah, so you have not come for any of the interviews. Um, IBM has been here. GE has been here. Uh, Chase Bank has been here. And they ran down a list of about 15, and they said, and you haven't come for any interviews. What are you doing? And I said, well, you know, I don't really know what I want to do. Or whatever I do, it needs to be 75% technical, 25% business and management, and I will change the emphasis as I go through my career. I thought that sounded good. It probably sounded stupid to the person that I was talking to, because I don't know what you do with that information if somebody said that to me now. But that's what I said. And so they said, well, if you forget that you have an engineering degree, I can have you a job on Wall Street this time next week for $40,000 a year. That was big money. This is now 1979, OK? And I said, OK, let me think about it, and I'll come down and get with you. I never went. I went to work for that job in DC for $19,500 a year because that was still decent money. It wasn't quite 25000 but it was kind of within range, and that's it. So what I will say about me is I do what I want to do, what I feel a passion to do, and I would encourage any and everybody, as you're thinking about it, things that seem like a long time, time is short. The same time, don't be too much in a rush to make the dollar. Be more in a rush to find the thing that you're passionate about. Because when you run into an obstacle and you're doing something you're passionate about, the obstacle is just that, an obstacle that you're going to overcome. If all you're doing is chasing the dollar, so there's really no passion in what you're doing, and you run into an obstacle, you start thinking, oh, I need to do something else. You start thinking about a different path. Why? Because you're not passionate about what it is you're doing. If you follow the passion, the results will come, or at least you'll feel fine about what it is you're doing. The dollar can only buy you but so much. 
No, it's better to have some than not having. I'm not <laughs> yeah. suggesting that. But you do have to eat. You do have to pay your rent. You don't want to get evicted. Um, but if you're doing what you love, you will be successful. It, and one more question I have for you before I open up the mic. I don't want to skate right past it. I did share uh, with everyone that uh, you were the chairman of Fannie Mae. Would you mind just giving a brief overview of what Fannie Mae does? I don't want to assume that everyone knows that. And sort of what was your role in that? I'm sure most people don't know it because even, even when I went on the board, I didn't really know it. <laughs> um, think, you know what the primary mortgage market is and the secondary mortgage market? Okay, so you need a mortgage, you want a mortgage, you want a mortgage. I sound like Oprah Winfrey, sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Okay. Um, you are going to SunTrust or Truist Mortgage or some other mortgage company to get a mortgage. You're buying a house. That mortgage company pays the builder. You knew you put down your $5,000 or $10,000 and you're in a $300,000 house and you have a mortgage for 200 and call it $290,000. Where did that money come from? That mortgage company or the bank paid the builder and now you owe them and you're gonna pay that mortgage off over time. That is the origination process. That's the primary market. That means the front line of the mortgage process. But if that bank does that, and it does it for you, and you, and you, and you, pretty soon they don't have any money to do it anymore. So how do they get money? Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, buy those mortgages from the bank. Those banks aggregate the mortgages, sell them to Fannie and Freddie. So Fannie and Freddie are secondary market players. They're in the secondary mortgage market. They're not in the primary, they're not at the front line. They never originate mortgages, but they buy the mortgages from the aggregators and so on. Now, they can only do that but so much before they're out of money. So what do they do? They bundle those mortgages, create a security that people can invest in, and they sell that security all over the world. They put their signature on it, guarantee the buyer such and such a percent return, and that makes it a decent security. And because they seem to have the, the backstop of the US government, it's viewed as a solid investment, and it's almost like cash. So rather than holding cash and getting no return, you can buy a mortgage-backed security, sometimes called agency securities. The agencies are Fannie and Freddie you can buy those securities, and that's like having cash, except you're getting a return on it. That instrument is sold everywhere. The same banks and others buy it, so they have cash, but it's earning something. Countries buy it, and so they're holding some of their assets that way. And so that's the source of direct foreign investment into the United States if people outside are buying these securities. So that's what Fannie and Freddie do. Fannie Mae is the largest financial institution in the world. It's a $3.2 trillion in assets. I got on the board because a friend, uh, when the market crashed in 2008, going into the Great Recession, um, a friend of mine who is chair of the board of the trustees at the University of Pennsylvania, and I was on the board, um, called me one day and said, Egbert, uh, I want you to consider getting on the board of Fannie Mae. Is that something you'd want to do? And I said, well, not really. I had just finished a seven-year term on the Atlanta Fed. And I said, I have a company to run. I don't have any more time for that. So I told him no. He said, well, I gave your name to this guy who was picked by the Treasury, Secretary of the Treasury to help bail out the mortgage system and fix Fannie Mae. And he said, I gave him your name, so he's going to call you anyway. <laughs> so he called me the next day, and I told him no. Two days later, both of them called me together. 
and the sucker I am, I caved in. So I went on the board of Fannie Mae, um, December 20-something of 2008, right at the crash. And I was on the board for 10 years. Five years in, the board chair aged out, meaning he turned 72, and there was a line in the sand, you can't be on the board beyond the age of 72. So the rest of the board asked me if I would step into the chairman's role. So I became the chair of Fannie Mae for the last five of my 10 year tenure on the board. Wow, wow, wow. So that's. So with that, uh, and first, thanks for sharing that. Uh -huh. um, with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to the audience. Uh, those of you, which I see a lot of you that are in my class, I continue to say uh, what I believe to be true, that success leaves clues. Success leaves clues. Um, uh, you, you've heard a story of a, a gentleman that is really impacting uh, the country with mixed, um, mixed uh, income housing, um, clearly been on the board of Fannie Mae. Um, uh, while Modest has had quite a bit of success, um, a lot of information you can learn here. I would entertain a few questions um, directly from the audience. Would anyone like to ask a question? Thank you so much for being here. My question is, uh, you're, you've done so much work in the area of mixed income housing. I'm wondering, uh, reflecting upon your, your period with, uh, with, with, with Fannie, what is the public policy support now for mixed income housing, and perhaps uh, what, what should it be if it's not everything it should be at this um, Yeah, I, I spoke to about Fannie in the context of single family homes, because I was talking about mortgages. I should have said it's also the largest f financier or funder of multifamily housing, rental housing. Um, it's not, when the market crashed, the first thing that happens in a crash is everything that is deemed to be not the safest of safe investments, those get cut out. And then, so you get down to a very tight band so you can minimize risk. And that invariably means that the things that are viewed as serving people at the edge of the credit box, meaning higher or lower FICO scores um, and less ability to make down payments beyond certain levels and so on, those are the people that get left out. And so for a number of years during the crisis, the support for affordability was somewhat compromised, but the agencies turned around by around 2012, 12, 13, somewhere in there. And as we got to be more solid and uh, we had started the reform of the financing system, and by the way, a third of the U.S. economy is driven by housing, one third all the jobs and all the stuff that comes as a result of housing, one third of the entire US economy is, uh, is driven by housing. Um, so once things started to get back in order, we started to loosen up the credit box and get back to serving more broadly. So there's always a commitment, but it got sh shrunken a little bit and then expanded. Right now we're doing what we used to do. is not so much about mixed income as it is trying to make housing more affordable to people across a broad range of incomes. Not necessarily in the same communities as in a mixed income development, but just responding to housing affordability across income such that lower, middle, upper income families can have access to um, housing. And I say families, also individuals. Um, my question for you is, did you feel any fear stepping into the chairman position after the one before you moved out? I was afraid people would figure out I didn't know what in heaven's name I was doing. But no, um, not really. You know, the, 
the fact of the matter is I, my view of the world is if you can do it, I can do it. Uh, you know, there's no, I haven't met my superior. I have met my equal many, 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 many times over, probably millions of them walking around. I've never met my superior. So if I want to do something, I can do that something. And my view in life is if I don't know something, it's just because I haven't studied that something. And there's nothing wrong with ignorance. We're all ignorant about something. I don't know how to fly a plane. Do I think I can fly a plane? Sure. Give me a little time, I'll probably put in, I'll probably go work at it 24 hours a day for a little while and so on, then I'll know how to fly a plane. I just happen not to know right now. And that's how I approach just about everything. Um, it may be a false sense of security, but it, it works for me. Uh, my question is going to be to soccer. Uh, I was wondering, as an ex-soccer player, what was your position as a, as a player in, in life? I played midfield, um, which is, I think, is the hardest position to play. Actually, I was more offensive, uh, more of an offensive midfield player. So when I wasn't playing midfield, I would go and play on a wing. Um, I was fast, very fast, um, and my direction changes were an important part of my game. Um, I, I'm going to take it off from your question and say something to all of the young people here because you all keep hearing, well, who is the GOAT? Is it Messi? Is it Ronaldo? Et cetera, et cetera. Let me tell you all, that is the most ridiculous statement. Messi, Ronaldo, none of them hold a candle to Pele. Now, let's be clear what I mean by that. Imagine that you can take Messi's speed and his killer left foot. You can take Ronaldo's speed and style and bicycle kicks and high jumps for headers, etc. You can take the speed of Mbappe. You can take all these guys. Understand that Edson Arantes de Nascimento, Pele, was doing every one of those 60 years ago. He didn't have one or two things he did. Take all of their three best skills and add them all together, Pele was doing those. And Pele did that at a time when he did not have market permission. So I'm going to talk to you about what market permission is. And it's important to, it'll mean more to those of you who are in the room that are melanated, okay, of color. You do not have market permission. Let's say society, the business community, etc., does not give you market permission to do what it is you probably plan to do in life. It was never conceived that you were going to be at the table when the real estate industry or the such and such industry was first developed. So you have two options in life. You can play a game that somebody else has defined for you, didn't have you in mind, so you're now trying to play in somebody else's game. You're going to be frustrated, not because they're, in, they're targeting you. You don't fit the part. They, you're, you're going to be struggling to get into the clubs. You don't have the relationships. You don't have a family history of being two generations in the real estate, market, real estate industry. You're not talking about that at the dinner tables. You don't have market permission. When you go in that game and it's somebody else's game, you're fighting, beating your head against the wall. I'm not being mentored the way I should, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a hard slug. Be prepared that that's a challenge. You can also choose 
to do that for a little while, but eventually create your own game. One where you have a chance of being successful because you're going to change the rules so that it works for you. Those are your two choices. Play along inside somebody else's box or create your own box. And neither one of those paths is fast and easy. That's what I mean by market permission. You're going to have to create your own market permission, and that's the path you have in front of you. So just to close out, to bring it back to Pele, when Pele was playing, the way he played was considered objectionable. Too much style, too much flash, too much whatever, and he did it anyway. And what do, they, what do they call soccer now? Thank you. The beautiful game. That's where it came from. He introduced a way of playing instead of the rigid, structured whatever that was dominate, the dominant play of European teams. That's how it came, became the beautiful game. You can create your own beautiful game by changing the rules to work for you. Is it true that after a number of years um, dealing with mixed income housing, that those particular uh, units or houses, um, the clause is removed and then they no longer have to operate as mixed income housing? Uh, understanding your purpose for um, wanting to start the, the mixed income housing, um, if that is true, I want to know how you feel about it and then how can we embrace the idea of mixed income housing um, as a whole, so that it's just an idea that we actually hold true to? Uh, it's a great question. It's the challenging question that a lot of people ask. But you know, if it costs you $275,000 to build a unit of housing, you have to have enough rent being collected to be able to pay for it, right? And so the market is setting the price. For you to now charge a number less than that, meaning you're somewhat subsidizing it, depends on how much assistance you get through other channels. So maybe you get a site that is publicly owned, and so the public cares about affordable housing, so they sell it and provide a discount and say, I'm giving you this discount if you make such and such a percentage of your units affordable. Well, that discount only has a certain value. And maybe that means you can only afford to make it affordable for 10 years before you run out of money and you're on the water. So how you make it affordable and keep it affordable depends on create financial engineering, creativity, in how you structure the transaction to be able to maintain the subsidy. So it's not a, a simple answer as to how long is it affordable and how long should it be. It's a function of the subsidy. Most of the affordable housing developments we do, we try to see if we can get the duration of affordability to 40 years, which is a long time. Um, uh, no simple answer. Okay. So, hello again. You mentioned your chasing your passions being your driving force to, for why you do what you do, um, and you were able to achieve that. With that being said, what are your passions now? Like, what do you plan to do? Are you looking into any new, like, business endeavors? Or, um, like, basically, kind of, what is your next step? Are you resting? Like, how does that come through? Um, I am actually, I live that question every day just so you know, and you will too. Um, so I do not just do that anymore. Integral started out doing that. We created the legal, regulatory, and financial model for mixed income to work. And we've done a lot of that, but we all...